What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. As y'all know, it's right there. It's free, and that enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your guys' support and helping us keep growing. And man, really appreciate it. Now, today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by a slug of many groups, many things, and uh, much music. So thank you for coming through, sir. Yo, thank you for having me, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Big fan. I, I, I love your work. Thank you, sir. Likewise. So, thank you. yeah, we'll, uh, we got a lot to talk about today. So let's get right into it. One of the early songs I remember from Atmosphere taken away back was the brief description. And on that one, uh, as I got to learn more about you guys being from Minneapolis and everything, I always was so struck that you talked about the, the Zulu Nation wannabes and all this different stuff. Junior high, hallway kings, lock and tag and MCs, beatboxing, breaking Zulu Nation wannabes. What was going on in Minneapolis in this era that made you say that? Oh man, in the 80s, like probably, the majority of cities that were not New York or LA, um, we were we were enamored with New York specifically and Los Angeles though, but for for different reasons actually. Um, in the eighties, New York was where my music came from, and Los Angeles is where my movies and television came from. So having those uh, on either side of me constantly being fed to me uh it it it, it create it's like you know it's like having a, a, a step parent like it's like my stepdad was uh, had a new york accent and so i started to stop pronouncing my r's at a certain age you know what i'm saying it's like in minnesota we say r we say think it's hard it's hard out here you know what i'm saying but i was saying things like it's hard you know what i mean like it's like uh and that was all hip-hop you know, if I could get anything from New York as far as magazines, uh, VHS tapes, uh, mixtapes from the radio shows out there, I was a fiend for all that stuff. I collected it all. I still have most of the stuff that I collected as a kid because I'm also, a, I'm a, a, what do you call it? Not a pack rat. What is it? I, I like, uh, hoarder. I to, I'm a hoarder. I'm a 100% hoarder. Uh, you know, well, I shouldn't say 100%. My mom is a hoarder, so I'm half hoarder. Um. Nonetheless, Zulu Nation was like, to me, it was like, Zulu Nation was like an army that I was ready to be drafted by at any given moment. If, if Zulu Nation put out the call and said, the draft is on, we're taking everybody 15 and up, I was ready to go and, and, and prove, you know, prove my worthiness. We're like, what do I got to do? Like, you got to tag on that wall. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go tag on that wall. And you got to do, do a head spin. I'm going to give it a shot. I can do the turtle walk. You know what I mean? Like, I was ready to just prove myself. I, I learned how to transform on the, the turntables. I, I, you know, I, and so when I said that, and mind you, that was like 25 years ago now. So I'm not going to be able to, like, access the exact mind state but what i can access is what i know of myself and who i am and and how i came to be what when i said that not only was i hoping that somebody from zulu nation would hear it and be like yo would you like to join you know what i'm saying like because god knows it probably could have been as easy as just filling out one of those like subscription cards like so what do you do do you, do you circle one break dance you know what i'm saying it's like uh but I wanted, I wanted to be part of Zulu Nation. I had some friends that were, you know what I'm saying? My friend uh, Stage One, DJ Stage One, and, and my friend Felipe, they were part of Zulu Nation officially. So I, I wanted in, but I just didn't want to be like, you know, like, okay, guys, can I be down? You know what I'm saying? I wanted somebody to reach out and be like, yo, we heard the shout out. What's good? You know, never happened. I'm still, I'm still not a universal B-boy. Um, nonetheless, I'm keeping hope alive. You know what I mean? Like one of these days I'm going to get the call or the email or the DM or something. And they're going to be like, all right, fuck it. Here's your beads. I'm going to put my beads on and get busy anyway. All right. So, so, so I think you see where I'm going though. I said it as a way to pay my homage, pay my respect to also speak to the people in my city that were younger than me and let them know what this was and, and, and what it is all in that one line, you know, this was still pre-Google, so you couldn't just be like, oh, I'm going to go Google what that means. You had to ask somebody. Now, I imagine if, a, if, a, if a, like a 20-year-old were to hear that, they could go Google what Zulu Nation is, and 
be like, oh, look, why are they dressed like that? <laughs> ah, man, I, I, I have pictures in my head of like Africa, Bambada and all them dudes in the 80s and just with all the all the man. That's why I bought that coat, the sheepdog that I was telling you about the other day. Uh, I, I wanted I wanted to be from New York so bad, bro. I bought a sheepdog. I got I got some gold fronts for the top. I mean, I, I've worn them once. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> what was the question? <laughs> About the Zulu Nation wannabes. I, I, I was a Zulu Nation wannabe. I was a wannabe. You know what I'm saying? But I, the thing that struck me about it was growing up in Maryland, right in between Baltimore and D.C., I didn't remember going to either Baltimore or D.C., which I did a lot, and seeing Zulu Nation wannabes or dudes that I thought were aspiring to be that. So it was just intriguing to me that in Minneapolis, you felt that way enough to put it in a put it in a song to put it in brief description. Listen, man, I think that it's it's likely that here in Minneapolis and in other cities in the Midwest, we felt that way even more than the people on the coasts. And and I I will defend that statement by saying it's because we had literally no birthright to it. We had no there was there was there was just no access. And so we went out of our way to prove how hip hop we were all the time. You know, it was almost like, it was almost like, you know, that the kind of like a, the, the stereotypical parent yelling at their kid, like, why are you listening to this crap? It's a fad. It's going to go away. And the kid's like, nope. It's not a fad and I will die before it goes away. That's kind of what we were on. We were, we were ready to prove it. You know, I see it sometimes too, when I'm on tour, because now in Minneapolis, it's not like that anymore. Now Minneapolis has finally accepted its, its, its space within this culture. You know what I'm saying? But like, sometimes we'll be on tour and we'll go through a city and I'll see people just like overly repping. And I'm like, yeah, those are my people. Cause I was, I was, I was that, that's what I came from was overly repping. You know, it's honestly, it's kind of hard to find that in the U S anymore. But when I first started touring like 20 years ago, you would see it all the time. We'd go through certain Midwestern cities and see that and, and know right away. That's the homie. You know what I'm saying? I go to scribble jam and it would be a festival full of these nerds. You know what I'm saying? All of these like overly hip hop nerds. That's what we were. You know what I'm saying? Like we really wanted to just prove it now. I'll go to like Europe or Japan and see it. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like, cause these are people who are so far removed from New York that look, I, even how I just said New York, we're getting into this conversation and I'm like, I'm like reverting back. I said, New York, you know what I mean? Like it's New York. Okay. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it's because it's like, you know, you know that you, you don't own it. You didn't create it. It's not yours. How some people will say you're a guest in here. So as a guest, I wanted to be the best fucking guest I could be. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that you knew that not only did I respect what it was, I respect where it came from. I respect what it stands for. I will never spit upon your grave. You know what I'm saying? Like even to this day, I, you know, you'll be hard pressed to find me saying something bad about a rap artist. You know what I'm saying? Because I still am like of the belief that like you, 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 you don't, you don't say bad things about them. You don't say bad things about, 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 about people who came up out of nothing and made something out of nothing. You know what I'm saying? It's nothing but reverence and respect. Right. And uh, somewhat tied into that early on too with God's bathroom floor. We've talked a few times over the years or several times over the years uh, intermittently. And I remember you had told me with that song, that was the first song you remember people coming up to you and having different interpretations for something you wrote. And as a, artist um how, did, how when that first started happening how did that make you feel like were you comfortable did you think it was weird like what what was going on in your mind as an artist well for transparency when we talk about that era for my in my life when when that was occurring when god's bathroom floor became a when it became public when people heard it when people had an opportunity to react to it or to talk to me I was also in maybe the most self-destructive era of my life. And so a lot of what I can say to you right now is not based on actual memory, but based on knowing who I am now and what I came from and what I went through to get there. So what I would say is this, 
um, when people started coming up to me and having interpretations of my music, not only does it make me realize that, oh, so my music's not very straightforward because that's not something I ever intended. I didn't intend like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to write like this, or I'm going to make it like this. It's just, it just gradually went there. God's bathroom floor actually um, could be seen as a catalyst for why it went even further. Because when I got validated by people for that song, that likely naturally made me go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to explore that. You know what I'm saying? Like people like that. Oh, okay. I'm going to explore that. Oh, people like the fact that I'm having like an anxiety attack on stage mid song. Okay. I'm going to open myself up to that. You know what I'm saying? And, and I don't think it was necessarily like a healthy point of my life, but it's, it's a, it's a point that was there that it had to be there for whatever reason. Now, at first when people started being like, Oh, that song is like this. And then, you know, when you said that, it, you know, I, and I realized you, you, you were talking to me because I, I, cause I feel like that too. And then they're explaining to me what they're feeling. And I'm like, mm, that's not what the song is about, but, but keep going. I'm going to let you go because what you're making this about is likely cooler to you than what you would think it, if I told you what it was actually about. So I'm not, I'm not going to kick the kitten here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let you have your kitten and pet your kitten. This is yours. And I'm just going to opportunize the moment. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, you know, so I, I rolled with it. Um, it wasn't until maybe a year later that I realized, okay, if I'm going to roll like that, then I have to also accept some of the, um, I guess some of the, some of the non benefits, whatever the, whatever the antonym for benefit would be, uh, the detriments. cons, detriments. The, the detriments, uh, yeah. because I started to see like certain songs, people were, they were reinterpreting and, and making them feel gross to me. And I was like, well, I can't get in the way of your interpretation. So I'm just going to stop acknowledging that song. And through my career, any songs that felt that way, I stopped acknowledging them. I mean, don't get it twisted. I still accept whatever money the streamers give me for them, but I don't perform them. I don't talk about them. You know what I'm saying? It's like, there's certain songs that I, it's, it's, and it's not so much that I'm like, oh my God, I regret having made that song, but more so sometimes I feel a little like I should have done a better job at, 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 at opening myself up and being more vulnerable to allow people to see what some of these songs actually meant to me, as opposed to just always letting people have their own way with them, you know, uh, and it's weird because there's certain songs like uh, Fuck You Lucy that have have crossed those tracks and then cross back over and then come you know it's like my relationship with a song like fuck you lucy sometimes i'm like oh okay i'm okay with this song right now and then other times i'm like oh this song freaks me out because people are using it as a way to stimulate and almost fucking celebrate their anger and their aggression and sometimes that'll freak me out a little bit you know what i'm saying especially as i get older man i'm trying to make the shows feel you know like fucking hugs you know what i'm saying i want i want all these people to come in here and not only feel like they got their their money's worth because i'm super neurotic about that but also i want people to leave here you know i want to leave this place better than i found it if that makes any sense you know what i'm saying and so it's like man so sometimes it's kind of hard to reconcile that with some of the music that i've made over you know the however many years that we've been doing this you know be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national 
gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.